Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter. And for our meditation this morning, we're going to be in a very familiar uh, passage of Scripture. And uh, yet the word that is living and active continues to show and reveal new things about who God is and what he wants for his children, which is why it continues to be so active over so many hundreds of years. So let's just take a fresh breath and invite God's Spirit as we look at this passage and then um, see what God has to say to us through it. Let's start with verse 25. And a lawyer, Luke chapter 10, verse 25, And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Now, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Go and do the same. It's an interesting parable, isn't it, that Jesus has given in answer to a question which the lawyer posed, and who is my neighbor? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, and He then poses this question, and who is my neighbor? Now, now we read that it comes out of him wanting to justify himself. Because here he was in the midst of all the people, a lawyer who was treated uh, with some amount of respect in in that culture. And he was posing a, a question to Jesus, who was coming off of talking to his disciples, the 70 that had come back, And they were talking about how wonderfully the demons had obeyed them. And Jesus takes them away from the miraculous and draws them down to one point that he says is more important than anything else. And that point is found in verse 20. He says, don't rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Is your name in that Lamb's book of life. That's the most important question. That's what you need to focus on. Not the power that you see that is evident through what God is doing in you. That's not the celebratory moment. It's about celebrating this fact that my name is written in the book of life. Coming off on this, the lawyer asks, how can I get eternal life? And Jesus turns that question and asks him to answer it. Being a lawyer, you should know it. 
was the impl- implication. And he does. He responds and he says, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, correct, you have answered it. Imagine somebody trying to be pompous and a know-it-all, asking a question that he thought would stump Jesus. Because the Bible tells us that he asked the question wanting to put Jesus to the test. And Jesus turns that on his head and makes him answer his own question. And so you can see all the, the pomposity and the ego and all getting drained from him, isn't it? And then wondering, how do I get back into this dialogue? And he thinks to himself, okay, I'll ask a a follow-up question. By the way, who is my neighbor? And again, Jesus didn't answer that question, but gave him a parable about this man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And everybody who was there would have known that this was a treacherous road because it was a treacherous road. Robbers often lay in wait for people to come down that road. And it so happened that this man was beaten up by the robbers, stripped, left half dead, and lying there waiting for help. And then Jesus says there's a priest who comes by, and one would think that the priest would stop and help. But the priest, it seems, Jesus said, crossed and the road and went his way. And then a Levite came and again hope must have arisen because if somebody who works in the synagogue and all of that can pass my my way, will he not then extend help to me? But he too crossed the road and walked away. And then a Samaritan comes and you, if you know the history between Jews and Samaritans, you might see that this man's face must have turned red. Because suddenly Jesus is bringing in somebody who was so against the Jews and who the Jews were against as well. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. They couldn't stand each other. And suddenly Jesus introduces a Samaritan into this story. And he says, worse than anything else, the Samaritan comes and is filled with compassion and stops. Stops the priest pass by. The Levite passed by and a Samaritan, hated by the Jews, actually stops, looks at this man, takes the oil and the wine that he had for himself, bandages up his wounds, puts him on his own beast and he walks then in front to the inn, makes him comfortable in the inn and then tells the innkeeper, listen, if you run out of money because of the care that you will take of this man. When I come back, I will repay you. Take good care of him. And then Jesus asks the lawyer, he said, tell me, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Once again, Jesus is forcing him to answer his own question. And the man says, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. Notice here that Jesus didn't answer the question. Right? He didn't answer the question, who is my neighbor? And when you think about it, you can draw some kind of a a summation about it because a question like that Who is my neighbor? Answers really two questions. The first question it answers is, Who are the people that I have to love as my neighbor? But the second inherent question in that question is this, And who then is not my neighbor? Right? Because when you draw a circle and say, These are your neighbors, immediately you begin to know, who is not my neighbor. And that was part of what this man wanted to know. Tell me, who do I love? Who do I love? Who's my neighbor? And Jesus turns that question on its head again and says, let me tell you what a neighborly act is like. This is what a neighbor will do. And then he says, now tell me, 
who was a neighbor to this man? And he says, the man who showed mercy. He couldn't even say the Samaritan. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. In other words, stop placing rings around people whom you think you can help and love. You need to love everybody who is in need. That's what a neighbor does. That is who a neighbor is. What a wonderful way to handle questions, isn't it? The way Jesus showed. And I looked at it, I reread it, and I thought there are some three or four points that I wanted to share with us as we look at this particular passage and see what is it that we can learn from it today. And the first is this, that a neighborly act, a neighborly act means that everybody is included. Everybody is included. When you are called to be neighborly, you don't draw circles around people who are fit your social strata, your education level, how well off you are, how many degrees you have, your pedigree. Everybody is included in a neighborly act. The second is this. A neighborly act involves getting inconvenient. It involves getting inconvenient. Very often, the help that we afford to people who need help always comes from the overflow that we have, isn't it? Whether it's the overflow of our time, or money, or convenience. And yet what we learn from this is that this man, this Samaritan, he was also on a journey. He had, was coming from one place and headed to another place, just as the priest and the Levite were. They were also on a journey. He was willing to stop, willing to stop and say, I see somebody in need and my journey then takes second priority. This is my first priority, to be able to be inconvenienced is what a neighborly act must look like. And the third is that a neighborly act means giving up of your own things and making yourself vulnerable. Notice that the Samaritan took his own oil and wine and bandaged the wounds of this person. By doing so, he left himself vulnerable because they were still on the journey. What could have happened to this man could very well happen to the Samaritan as well. But he was willing to take that risk to help this man who was already half beaten and near death. His own oil, his own wine, which he would have kept just in case he needed it, he was willing to put out for this person. Then Jesus ends by saying, Go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I remember many years ago, <clears throat> 17 years ago actually, there's a point in my life where I needed to have uh, stents put into my heart and I was in the hospital and uh, one of our dear friends, John Samuel, who's no longer with us, came to the hospital to see me. And as he was leaving downstairs at the hospital, he f met his former boss. And his former boss looked at him and said, John, what are you doing here? Why are you in the hospital? And John said, my pastor is going to have an angioplasty, and so I just came to see him. And he said, who's the doctor? And so John told him who the doctor was. That was the end of the conversation. 
The next day or the day after, I don't remember, I was with the doctor and he was prepping me for surgery. I was lying on that table and then he came to me and he looked at me and he said, you know, I got the strangest call today. I got a call from this gentleman. This gentleman was John's former boss. He said he called me and he said, I understand that you're going to do an angioplasty on Pastor Clemens. And he said, yes, I am. He said, here's what I want from you. He says, the only thing that Pastor Clemens will leave the hospital with is the two stents that you're going to put in his heart. Nothing else. He said, I'll take care of everything else. You know, we finished the procedure and I was in the ICU. And all of a sudden, I had the first bed and so the door was here. I heard a voice. A man was standing there and I looked up, loud voice. He said, Pastor Clemens. And being right in the front, I looked up. And the thing is, he didn't know who I was. And I didn't know who he was. We'd never met. But when he said my name, I looked up and immediately he knew who I was. He just gave, did this to me, gave me a thumbs up and he left. He went down to the financial whatever that cashier's office or whatever and paid a bill that was over five lakhs and disappeared. John met him a couple of days later when he heard what had happened and he remonstrated with him. He said, no, you can't do this. We have insurance. The church can take care of it. And you can't do it. And this man stopped him with these words. He said, why can't a Samaritan do this? And John had nothing more to say after that. Why can't a Samaritan do this? And that's a good question for us too, isn't it? I mean, if we change it a little and say, why can't a Christian do this? What is it that we need to do as we look around us? Do we have the eyes of compassion that Jesus said the Samaritan had, which enabled him to stop? Or have we become so caught up, maybe even callous to needs and for various reasons that our eyes no longer deal with compassion. Maybe today they deal with cynicism. Done that, got hurt for it, not going to try it again or something like that. Or just don't care, it's not my issue. October, November are months of thanksgiving, isn't it? All over the world, we're thankful for the things that God gives us. And I think it's a lovely precursor to December where we celebrate Jesus and the birth that just has transformed our lives. And Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. And as Christmas comes along, I was thinking how often we do things to show that we love ourselves. We buy new clothes and put them on because we love ourselves. And other things that we love to do because of that love. And it's interesting that the Bible says, love your neighbor as yourself. What you just did for yourself, do it for your neighbors. Do it for people that are all around you who have needs. And do it not because you're a Samaritan, but do it because we are Christians. They know we are Christians by our love, as that old 
him goes. They'll know we are Christians by our love. That's basically the end of the sermon as I felt I needed to share with you. But as I was wrapping it up, I felt the Lord just laying something on my heart that I need to share with you. And the Lord, it seemed to me, His Spirit was so heavy on me that there are some of you here in this congregation, this service, who are not part of the priest or the Levite or the Samaritan. But in this whole story, you see yourself as the wounded man lying on the ground. That somehow you've taken a beating. Somehow you've lost so much. Somehow you're broken and down and out. And it seems like you don't have what it takes to get up. And I felt the Spirit of God just saying, I pray, before you close, pray for ones in this congregation who are in that exact spot, that somehow none of the things that happened with the Levite, the priest, the Samaritan mattered. Somehow your heart just resonated with that man on the ground, hoping that someone would have compassion and reach out. My leading was to pray for you before we closed the service. And so, can I ask you to be vulnerable this morning? And if that's, that's who you are, and you're saying, Pastor, that's exactly me and my situation, would you stand where you are? And as we close, I want to pray for you that God would reach out and touch you. And somehow, you would be touched with compassion today. Would you do that? Would you just stand if you are in need of that word? Oh, Heavenly Father, would you look with eyes of compassion, Lord, on all these precious ones who stand here in your presence. Lord, you know exactly why they stand. You know the condition of their hearts and their lives, Master. You know how broken they may be, how without hope they may be. And I pray, Abba, that you would reach out and touch them. Oh God, would you just let your eyes of compassion settle upon them? Would you let them know, Lord, that there's always hope because of you? God, would you touch each one? Lord, even Beyond the need they stand, I pray boldly for even your peace to descend upon them. Beyond the situation that they find themselves in. Beyond that travesty in their lives, Lord. Beyond the brokenness. Would you let your peace settle upon them? It's just a wonderful, calming presence that lets them know that the Almighty God still cares and his word is true. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Even in this place, God is saying, I am there with you. O oh, Abba, etch those words upon each one of their hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would assuage that situation. Meet them at this point, Lord. 
raise up people who can do what the Samaritan did and help us, Lord, to do it as Christians, as ones who love one another. I pray your blessing upon each one here, Lord, who stands, that when they sit, Master, they will know that the Almighty God is in their corner and will lead them through this trying time. And we will be careful, Abba, to give you all glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.